Thank you very much. Um, so I'm going to start with just a very brief introduction to circular RNA, and then I'll discuss the concepts behind one of the statistical algorithms that we've developed in our lab for detecting splicing, linear and circular RNA splicing from um, RNA-seq data. So over the past few decades, it's become clear that RNA plays an essential role in regulatory biology, apart from its role as messenger RNA coding for protein. This is exemplified by EXIST and other long non-coding RNAs and small non-coding RNAs, including microRNAs and catalytic RNAs. And this list just continues to expand. Compared to some of these more recently discovered non-coding RNA classes, we know a lot about um, messenger RNA um, from the past 50 plus years of research. So as it's well known, it's thought that the function of coding genes is to produce messenger RNA that then codes for protein. And alternative splicing is a process by which a subset of exons can be combined to create different RNAs from the same gene locus. And this can diversify the proteome. But in 2012, statistical algorithms developed by our lab discovered a new type of RNA being produced by, these, um, by this gene locus, um, a case where um, a downstream exon is joined to a further e e upstream exon to create a circular rather than linear isoform. And in spite of a lot of interest in this and a lot of work from multiple groups over the last few years, um, the function of most circular RNA and um, how it's regulated is largely unknown. An early hypothesis was that circular RNA expression was just simply a byproduct of um, linear RNA splicing. So it was just transcriptional noise as opposed to an actual functional molecule. Um, and so under this model, you would expect the more highly expressed genes would have more circular RNA. But as we can see here, by looking at circular expression versus linear expression for genes that do produce um, a circular isoform, there really is no correlation. So this hints at the fact that there you know, is regulation of circular RNA apart from linear RNA, although the exact nature of that is still unknown. And over the past few years, we and others have learned that circular, circular RNA is expressed from thousands of human genes. Um, in some cases, the circular RNA can be more abundant than the messenger RNA from that same gene. It's conserved in very simple organisms. And it does exhibit cell type specific expression. And there's growing evidence of developmental regulation. So for, in the interest of time, my examples in the next few slides about our method are going to um, rely on circular RNA. But I just want to take a moment to point out that the same issues are really important for linear RNA splicing as well. And all of the algorithms that we develop are designed to address the issues for both linear and circular RNA. Um, so an issue is that exonic sequences can be very similar. And we can see this by just looking at these two gene models where the exonic sequences are shown in these colored boxes. In the first example, um, where the exonic sequences are very different, detecting and quantifying splicing is going to be much easier than in the case, um, the second case, where we have um, two, the two middle exons are, have very similar sequences. And this is even before we now have to take into account that we have to distinguish between a circular isoform from one of these homologous exons or linear splicing using these homologous exons. Um, so the fact is that a lot of unannotated RNAs abound, and until very recently, circular RNA um, was included in this. And the reason is that detection is confounded by noise. And so that's why statistical algorithms are really important to help us identify these unannotated RNAs. So over the last few years, several algorithms have been developed to detect circular RNA. And so I'm just going to step through the, the, broad, um, the broad workflow that most of these follow. So you start with unmapped reads, reads that didn't map to the genome or a linear splice junction. And you look for evidence of circular RNA splicing. So say we have this uh, portion of the genome where these two exons um, produce this circular RNA. And this circular RNA would be detected in sequencing data by a read that mapped from the exon 3 into exon 2. And impaired in sequencing, you're sequencing both ends of the fragment. And so read 2 would map somewhere within this defined circle. But sometimes you'll get errors in the data. And so you'll end up with a read 2 that mapped somewhere outside of that circle. And so these are going to be discarded as errors. 
And then there are other common known sources of false positives, and so those can be filtered out as well. And what you end up with is this list of circular RNA that's prioritized by read count. But these methods have very um, significant limitations. And the, the largest one is the, this prioritizing by read count. So you rank this list of genes um, by read count, and somewhere in this list you draw a line and you say, well, anything that has, say, five or more reads, I'm going to say that that's a real circular RNA. And anything with fewer reads, that's probably a false positive. So this is a problem because it reduces sensitivity, particularly for lowly expressed RNA. And it can cause us to overlook important genes because we know now that um, the level of expression is not necessarily tied to importance. And importantly, we have no idea about the false positive rates for many of these methods. So if you want to be a bit more stringent, you would say, okay, I'm only going to consider circular RNA that have 10 or more reads. And if you want to get more results, you can say, uh, you know, I'll take anything with two or more. But you have no idea how changing these thresholds actually affects the quality of your data or the level of false positives you're seeing. So what are these false positives and where do they come from? I'm going to step through um, a quick example here where a combination of exon homology and sequencing errors um, causes a false positive that's really hard to detect in the data. So we have this um, gene locus here with these four um, exons. Again, exon two and three are very um, homologous. They actually only differ in this example here um, in one nucleotide, which in exon two is a G and in exon three is a C. Um, and it produces a mRNA using all four of these exons. And so here we're going to look at two sequenced fragments that span this exon two, exon three junction. And due to a sequencing error, they're both red. There's actually a C red in that location, even though the real sequence contained a G. So both of these misaligned, read one misaligned to the exon 32 boundary due to the sequencing error, and it looks like this came from a circular RNA. And how, where read two maps, it changes how this data is interpreted. So fragment X obviously is an error, and it's going to be discarded because that read two mapped outside of the circle. Whereas fragment Y, even though we know it's an error in this case, we have no way to tell that from this data. And so this would be considered a circular read, and this is the false positives that I'm talking about. So in this fragment X, um, it can actually be used to help us in statistical models decide which of the, the reads that look like fragment Y, which of those are actually true positives and which are false positives. And so the statistical model that we use is a logistic generalized linear model, GLM. And it's a common and powerful statistical model used to distinguish between two groups. And so in this case, we have non-circular reads. We have a class that we think represent true alignments and another class that we think are most likely due to errors. And so we want to use these classes to predict for each of the circular reads which look like a, more like a true alignment and which look like false positives. So we use these to, to fit a model um, where properties of the, the read alignments are used. Um, so the probability of being in class one or being a true alignment is modeled based on the number of nucleotides that overlap the junction in the alignment, um, the number of mismatches in that alignment, and how unique that alignment is within the genome. And then we use this model to predict on this disjoint set of circular reads which of these look like they were true positives. And so the result is per read of the probability that it was a true alignment versus a false positive. And then for each putative circular RNA, we aggregate the per read probabilities to generate a, a posterior probability of whether that circle was actually expressed in the data or whether it was a false positive. So one of the ways that we tested our model is by analyzing RNA-seq data that was generated by two different library prep protocols for the same cell type. And so we know that in poly A plus libraries, circular RNA are depleted because they don't have poly A tails. Um, whereas in poly A minus libraries, they're going to be more abundant. But these preparation protocols aren't perfect, and so you're still going to find some circular RNA in the poly A plus libraries. But the majority that you find are probably going to be false positives, and the, one, the true positives that you do find are probably going to be at lower levels because of partial depletion. And so we looked at the posterior probabilities in these two libraries, and we found, as expected, that the posterior probabilities were very low for the majority of circular RNA detected in the poly A plus and were much higher in the poly A minus library. And so we looked in a little bit more detail at what these false positives were in the poly A plus library. And so the circles with the highest read counts 
had low, very low posterior probabilities, and a few are highlighted here. These are known false positives um, that are always post facto discarded by any circular RNA detection algorithm because of exon homology. Um, whereas several known circles were detected at low read counts with very high posterior probabilities. And so this was very exciting to us because it showed not only does our method provide information completely independent of read count, um, it can also be used even when the sequencing experiment wasn't designed just to look at circular RNA. So really quickly, we applied, um, we applied this method and we were able to discover some new biology about circular RNA that had been overlooked by other methods. Um, so we found that small circularized exons are more prevalent than previously estimated by other algorithms. We also found the first examples of circular RNA that are processed by the U12 or minor spliceosome. And we found global induction of circular RNA during human fetal development. Um, and so if anybody has any more questions about some of the details of these discoveries or details of the algorithm, feel free to come and find me during lunch or one of the breaks um, later today. Um, but I want to thank all the members of my lab, as well as um, our collaborators at UCSD and the Laurent Lab and sources of funding. Thank you. Questions? Here, okay, let's do in the middle here and then second there. Actually, I think you get the mic for me. Go ahead. Oh, <laughs> Um, the main thing I was missing is what, what are the inputs to your GLM that's deciding whether this read was misaligned or not? So we, in this algorithm specifically, we used bow tie. Um, you can use any other liner. So you align oh, your reads using I'm bow tie. sorry, the covariates going into the GLM. Oh, so we fit the model. Like we, we obtain betas for, sorry, um, are you asking what the predictors were? Yeah. Okay, sorry. So that was the number of nucleotides in the alignment um, that overlapped the junction, um, the number of mismatches, and the mapping quality, um, or how unique it is. And that was that choice is limited essentially by you know what information we have available from the aligner we were using. And in subsequent in subsequent work, we've been using other features and, and trying to improve that as well. Uh, it seems you are looking at regular and sick here. Uh, I, would, I was wondering if you try to enrich for circular RNAs, for example, digest the linear uh, MRAs, uh, such experimental methods. Yeah, so that's um, so using RNA SAR, which can digest the, the linear RNA. Um, that we use for validation of so all of the circles that, that we predicted, you know, a subset of the circles that we predicted, um, we validate by them. Um, the, our, just like any other library preparation method, RNAs-R is not perfect. And so, you know, for example, um, one circular RNA that we actually do, it's very well studied, it's very abundant, um, CDR1 antisense, it's actually sensitive to RNAs-R. So we don't use that like as a, um, as a genome-wide global validation. And also it, because of the CDR1 antisense example, it can cause you to overlook things. And so that's why we're trying to develop methods that you don't need to do that enrichment. And so you can look more at total RNA um, or poly A minus RNA and, and actually be able to still get signal. I was wondering uh, how much exon sequence uh, homology do you see within your uh, true positives? Within the true positives? Um, so, I mean, there is definitely exon homology, but so it, that's why you can't just use like any single factor um, for, you know, but in even just in the three factors, three predictors that we put into our, our model, um, you know, the, the, none of them singly predict um, as well as the combination. Um, so there's no, there's really no like distinguisher, oh, these have more exon homology than, than these. Um, there, there definitely is some, but the, the, we found that the, the predictors that we do use do help us distinguish, even when there is homology, um, are these really circles or, or not. It's, it's really more of a factor of all of the other things that are going into the alignment, which is why simply discarding anything that does have homology is um, not a great idea and why we're trying to have other ways. But I don't, I don't have an exact number for you know, how homologous some of the circles are. Okay, I think we'll take one more question, um, and then um, we'll have a, one more announcement. 
Oh, you already have a mic. Good. Uh, very nice talk. I'm wondering if you could talk about um, or speculate about other types of RNA isoforms you, that your algorithm might be able to identify, like um, trans-splicing events um, that might be missed by the traditional mapping algorithms. Yeah, so in extensions, we actually have somebody in our lab who's looking particularly at gene fusions. She's very interested in that in cancer. And so um, we're extending these methods to, to potentially um, be able to identify those as well. And so we need some modifications, but um, we have some early um, good results, and so we think that's promising. And other things like, you know, being able to detect indels or um, SNP locations, like some of some of the methods that we're trying to develop now are are focused on trying to be able to detect those as well. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you.